uh, it's it's not only the um, the development of the apps initially, but then as I mentioned, it's the maintaining and the updating. And we also um, have channels of feedback that we get. Uh, as I mentioned, some of it is from the research efforts where we're doing qualitative studies and doing quantitative kind of uh, system usability scales, mobile app rating scales, getting um, that type of data from our, our research participants. But we, we go broad, we'll go to the app store reviews, we'll, we'll really kind of parse them and, and, um, and code them and figure out what folks are wanting. Um, we'll get feedback that's sent to our email address as I'll share at the end. We get feedback from VA stakeholders, from clinicians, from e everywhere so that we can, um, we can make these apps um, better. Um, and then we, we update them with new versions over time. As I mentioned, our suite of apps uh, can be roughly kind of pulled apart into these two broad categories. So we have self-care apps and we have treatment companion apps. And I'll go through each of these um, in turn. So in terms of kind of the, the argument for why we think um, self-care apps are important to have out there, we believe that they can expand access to mental health services. Uh, I think it's been especially highlighted during the pandemic where uh, we've seen an increased need for um, services for anxiety and mood and sleep and, and even some um, uh, trauma um, conditions. So um, given that 85% of the US uh, population of adults currently own smartphones, we really think that we can get out there and reach folks with high quality psychoeducation, self-management tools, really informational kind of stuff that there's no reason why we wouldn't get it out there to folks. Um, they can offer real-time in vivo interventions. We, we All of the, I'm sure you, you hear these all the time, you know, the stigma, the ge geographical limitations, um, but we also believe they might help reduce provider time as well, and so that's kind of a cool area to explore. Um, and they also, uh, what's cool about smartphones is that uh, there doesn't seem to be disparities in, in um, ownership of smartphones as there are with um, other, uh, with access to care in general. So across racial and ethnic groups, it seems like um, there's similar levels of uptake. And then we know from the evidence um, that's accumulated over 20 years or more that um, that internet-based interventions and mobile phone apps that are coming on the scene have really strong evidence of efficacy. And so this was something that uh, David and his team and a group from, I think it was the Brambury Forum um, uh, published that it's kind of time, you know, it's maybe past time that for things like depression, anxiety, sleep, maybe PTSD, uh, it's time that we get these interventions out to, to folks uh, in need. In terms of the self-care apps that we have, we have, uh, as I mentioned, our first app being PTSD Coach that's been around now for uh, 10 years, but we also have PTSD Family Coach for partners um, and family members of uh, folks living with PTSD. So it helps them with dealing with their own challenges, um, dealing with a, a loved one who has PTSD. And it's not all about just supporting that loved one, but it's about also dealing with the, the burden that they, uh, they share from, from that PTSD. We have an anxiety, I mean, an anger management app. We have a Beyond MST for military sexual trauma survivors. Jason and team created this cool, cool couples coach that includes both an app for, uh, or an app for each of the, the, the people in the dyad, for each uh, member of the, uh, of the dyad, where they can actually kind of do things together through the app, which is really cool, our first foray in that space. We have COVID coach, which Dr. Um, Beth Jaworski uh, was kind of uh, wise enough to think about creating um, using existing PTSD coach framework um, and was able to get that out, app out in what for us was record time, only a few months um, once the pandemic hit. Um, and so that's been one of our most popular apps. It's been downloaded um, tens of thousands of times uh, time since it was launched in the spring of 2020. Uh, we have Insomnia Coach, which I'm going to talk a little bit about and share some emerging research on that we're excited to share. Uh, Mindfulness Coach, um, which uh, um, is one of our most popular apps uh, and consistently one of our most popular apps over the years. Um, and then Vet Change, um, which is um, an app for hazardous drinking. We are in the process of um, updating Stay Quit Coach with um, uh, Ellen Erps at uh, UCSF and the VA San Francisco. So that's not listed on here, but we do have an app for smoking cessation, a legacy app that's still available if folks are, are looking for an app for that. 
Here's just an example. This is PTSD coach. So again, we get feedback on acceptability and feasibility over time from our studies, as well as all the input from the field, uh, both from the wild and clinicians and VA um, and all the other channels that we get feedback on. And this is um, version 3.1, 3. Uh, 3 I believe it is. Um, and you can see here what's really cool is it's uh, got a real refresh, a real update of the, uh, of the user interface. Um, and if you look at slide number or panel number four there, you'll notice that that's in Spanish. So I think um, uh, when we did that, we actually increased our potential user base by about two, two billion people on the planet. So it's kind of a cool thing by just rendering the app in Spanish, uh, which you can do in the settings. Um, we actually uh, opened it up to the two billion uh, or so folks who on the planet who speak Spanish. So. Um, we try to update our apps uh, regularly as needed, um, but this was a, a major uh, refresh. And you can see the ratings in the, in the App Store and Google Play are really high. And I'm going to share some research on PTSD Coach shortly. The other uh, area um, that we, um, we've been building apps is for uh, treatment. Um, so with the provision of treatment, especially the evidence-based treatments, um, and so you can see that uh, if you bring an app or an MTech into care, it can improve the efficacy of that care. We have yet to kind of do anything like that with our apps. The tested uh, Greg Rieger at the University of Washington and the VA Puget Sound recently got a, uh, a merit, a VA merit uh, awarded to see what the impact of providing PE coaches. Uh, to PE, and so looking at PE with and without PE coach, and so it's going to be exciting to find out what the value add is there. But you could see here in a study, it's a small impact, but it's meaningful. Um, uh, so about 0.27 effect size in this in this uh, meta analysis that was done. There's also some promise that it could could increase the speed of improvement, right? So maybe there'll need to be fewer sessions. Maybe it could lead to lower dropout. Um, so folks are getting the the care that they need. Maybe you could, uh, you could uh, target additional kind of, um, uh, or uh, go after uh, additional treatment targets like insomnia or smoking if you're treating PTSD. Um, and then in terms of aftercare, so the maintenance of improvement, it could help with relapse prevention um, and it could uh, help to continue to improve uh, uh, after treatment. Oftentimes we see that in our evidence-based treatments where folks are starting to generalize the skills and internalize the skills. So it could help to support that. Here are uh, some of our treatment companion apps. So we have an ACT coach, so that supports acceptance and commitment therapy. We have CBTI coach, um, which uh, I'll share a little bit more about the, this one shortly as well. Um, but this is for cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. What's really cool about VA is that we have a whole bunch of provider communities, meaning we have these groups of providers who have been trained um, in evidence-based psychotherapies, um, including CBTI, ACT, CPT, PE. Um, and so with CBTI, um, this app is intended to help folks complete all of the homework and, and the sleep diaries and all that stuff. And it's one of our, our more popular apps and kind of led to the idea that we should be building a self-management app um, for insomnia. And I'll share more about that shortly. CPT coach, so it's for cognitive processing therapy. This is being uh, refreshed right now, I think in the hour before my talk, the um, tech into care group in VA. Uh, provided uh, some of the uh, preview of what that app is going to look like. Really nice, um, um, airy look and feel, and it's going to be a real improvement. Uh, then we have, oops, then we have a PE Coach, um, which supports prolonged exposure therapy. So they can do the recordings, the in vivo, they can listen to the imaginal, all of that on the app. Really convenient for the patients. We have Stair Coach. This is Dr. Marilyn Cloyter's um, skills training in affect and interpersonal regulation, STAIR. Um, so there's an app for that, which is also being refreshed. And then Stay Quit Coach, as I mentioned, is kind of for both uh, uh, self-care as well as for integrated care for smoking cessation, which is an evidence-based um, uh, treatment to help uh, veterans quit smoking. So here is an example of one of these apps. Um, this is CBTI Coach. Um, and you can see here that it includes um, the different uh, things that uh, are needed for the patient uh, to be doing while they're working with a provider 
um, doing cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. So uh, it's very uh, sleep diary intensive. Every day they need to complete sleep diaries so they can see that uh, in screen two there. Um, they can see how their sleep is over time, including uh, the ISI, as well as their uh, sleep efficiency and all of the other kind of treatment targets in that group. And then it has a whole bunch of, of um, CBT skills to help um, folks um, quiet their mind. And so this is based on Rachel Manber's uh, CBTI protocol that she disseminated in uh, VA. This is a direction we're going with these apps, and we believe that this is going to be super important to kind of get the 360, right, with uh, providers being able to see what um, the patients are doing uh, both between sessions, but then within sessions. So that, for example, in CBTI, the provider is given a whole bunch of paper uh, um, sleep diaries and needs to kind of turn around and, and enter them into, um, into the um, into the Excel spreadsheet to calculate things like time in bed um, and, um, and other uh, outcomes, how folks are doing. Um, so this provider dashboard uh, that we're developing, or we're developing a group of, of provider dashboards uh, in our VA App Connect system, is intended to help with having those data available, not only between, but at the point of care, so that it would make the, the session more efficient and you could focus on things other than entering sleep diaries or PCL or PHQ-9 data, um, but having that, as well as having um, data on how, the folk, how folks are using the app. So you can see here, this is just one screenshot of what it might look like for the sleep efficiency over time. Um, and this is an early version. Jason and team are right now developing uh, with the contractors, developing a, a lot better kind of visualization of these data, as well as providing what um, what the clinicians already are using so that the transition to using this dashboard won't be too hard. So it will include an Excel spreadsheet with all the app uh, entered uh, sleep diary data populated into that Excel spreadsheet. So that transition won't be too hard, um, but then they'll see the, the value of maybe some of the visualizations that we're working on with, uh, with some clinician input um, so that they can transition over um, and readily quickly see the important information they need in sessions and between sessions. So that's the suite of apps that we have right now. And there's a number of apps in pro progress uh, or in process um, that will be uh, launched over the next coming year. We have a really robust pipeline of, of uh, products that are, um, that are being developed. But just um, to kind of share that our apps are always free uh, and publicly available in the app marketplaces. So um, these are built with public money. This is you know US federal government, your tax, uh, payer dollars that we build these apps on, and you can go and see all of our different apps on the National Center's website there. Um, all of our apps are secure, so they don't share or require personal information. They're, all of the data that we get is fully de-identified, so all we know is about a download. It's really for business purposes at this point to know, like if uh, apps are having issues, um, just understanding what, what's useful, what's not useful in the apps, but we don't know anything about the, uh, the end user at all, uh, the person who downloaded the app. And they, end users can feel free to shut that off if they don't want any of their data being shared. Um, it's, they're fully Section 508 compliant. What that means if you're not in VA is that uh, Section 508 of the um, Americans with Disabilities Act um, dictates that we, the US uh, federal government um, makes all of its uh, resources uh, available to folks with different types of disabilities. So we have to go through a 508 review to make sure that these apps can be accessible by folks with visual and, and other types of impairments. They're evidence informed. So we always start with the evidence base and find out what's there and we develop it from that evidence base. And then we come back and we work to try to validate and see what other value our apps are providing through my kind of li my leg of the stool um, and other uh, collaborators. And we have a ton of collaborators out there beyond within VA, VA and then at other academic institutions. Um, they're fully functional without internet connection. So really kind of thinking about our rural users, our deployed users, folks who might not be able to um, access the internet so they can use all of the features of the app without uh, being connected to the internet. And then they're tailored to veterans and VA providers but they really can be used by anyone. So the, the mandate of the National Center for PTSD goes beyond uh, veterans. They're our primary group, uh, of course, 
but we are tasked with uh, also the, 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 the broader US uh, population. And so we, um, we obviously tailor them toward veterans, but we uh, don't make it so much so that folks would be off put and feel like this does not work for me um, because I'm not a veteran. So the next question is, do the VA app, uh, VA, uh, VA National Center apps improve outcomes? We've done a series of studies. Um, our first randomized control trial was uh, with uh, Dr. Adam Miner, who was not Dr. Adam Miner at the time. He was, who may, many of you at CBITS know. Um, he was a, uh, a PsyD student in our, in our uh, Stanford um, PGSP consortium. Um, and so Adam and I co-led this uh, RCT funded by Clinic in Hand and VA um, to uh, do a pilot study of PTSD coach. And so we didn't know how long to have folks use the app. Uh, we didn't know what to expect. I was not expecting to see any kind of signals in PCLs or you know, the PTSD checklist. Um, so we just kind of put it out there to see what might be there to get an idea of what maybe the effect would be to inform future research and development. Um, and so we had folks use the app for one month or be waitlisted for one month. And then we had a two month follow up. We had 49 participants, mostly women in their mid 40s, um, mostly white, um, pretty highly educated, uh, seven, more than three quarters with some level of uh, college. Um, and then a PCL, which was pretty high. So 40 in civilians is considered kind of the probable PTSD. We had 61 in this sample, so pretty high. PTSD symptoms. What we found was a, um, a, a small effect, so a D of 0.25 in terms of symptom improvement. And you can see those two dots are not really uh, different at post-treatment, but the slope uh, of change is different for these two groups. Um, so maybe something's happening. Uh, when we, um, so you can see here that when we look at the effect sizes, um, there's actually a, a Statistically, statistically significant effect size for the PTSD coach group versus the wait list, even though the interaction wasn't significant. Um, but then what you can see is if uh, we looked at two months at the follow-up, um, folks are continuing to improve. So now the effect size is uh, within group effect size for PTSD coaches is, uh, is large. Um, and when we cross over uh, the folks who were waitlist initially, the effect size for, um, for them um, uh, is essentially the same as what we saw when we gave the app out initially. So delayed treatment, if you, if you think about it that way. So something is happening here, something that really surprised me because um, I really wasn't expecting it given kind of the low intensity, the choose your own adventure of PTSD coach, the types of interventions that are in there. But these data were telling us that something uh, might be happening with PTSD coach. You can see here, if we look at clinically significant improvement, meaning those folks who improved by at least 10 points on the PCL, about 40% of those who got PTSD coach in that first month versus 20% or so in the wait list, you can see that there was a, a double, double the amount of clinical significant, clinically significant change. And then if we look at when we crossed over the folks from wait list to PTSD coach, almost half of them had a 10 point change on the PCL. So Really intriguing, unexpected uh, findings from my side, thinking about evidence-based treatments in VA, veterans with PTSD, although these were not veterans, they were civilians, but really kind of thinking about the chronicity of PTSD to see these was really super encouraging. So overall, we found some important findings here, uh, pretty large effect sizes over two months. Um, we didn't see any kind of uh, um, relationship, and this is a very small pilot study, uh, between app use, uh, weekly app use, which was, at the time was self-reported. We didn't have the app instrumented to be able to see actual use. Um, and then we could see that um, one of the kind of the art of historical artifacts of this study is at the time, because everybody didn't have smartphones, we were doling out iPod touches to folks. Um, and what we found there is that when we give somebody an iPod Touch and we have them sign the form that says, if you lose this iPod Touch, the VA is going to come and get you. I, I suspect a lot of folks were not carrying them around, but you could see iPod Touch users did not benefit as much as um, folks who were using their own smartphones. So uh, with this, uh, all of these learnings in mind, we launched a larger trial to really test the efficacy. And this was with uh, Bar Taylor at, at, uh, at Stanford and, and, and our, our group at VA. Um, this was an RCT with three months of PTSD coach use. So we saw that there was additional improvement was happening in that second month. So we figured, oh, 
you know, most psychotherapy trials are 12 weeks. Why don't we go ahead and just make it a three month kind of um, to make it kind of uh, similar to those trials. Um, and so we randomly assigned folks to either get PTSD coach or wait list. Um, trauma survivors had to have at least a PCL uh, four of 35 or higher. So some level of PTSD, subclinical or sub threshold up to probable PTSD. And they had to own a smartphone this time. So we weren't gonna play the iPod touch game. And, and at this time, um, probably we were up in the 60, 70% of folks having um, smartphones out there in the US population. So we thought the PTSD uh, coach would lead to, to greater symptom improvement than wait list. And we thought that the, these gains would be maintained at six month follow-up. So post uh, six month post baseline. The sample looked almost identical to, including the level of PTSD severity being very high, given once again, 40, 44, somewhere in there is the probable PTSD diagnosis for the PCL4. So what we found this time was uh, again, kind of a modest medium, you know, somewhere in there 0.42, effect size for the, uh, the rate of change, the slope for PTSD coach being more negative than the wait list, uh, still kind of competing with some, uh, some change in the wait list there. But if we look at the, uh, the follow-up, we can see that overall, um, the folks in the PTSD coach condition had a 14 point decrease on the PCL um, from, uh, from baseline. So really encouraging uh, findings there. And look like that, you know, they're obviously were maintaining whatever benefit they had in those first three months. If we look at clinically significant change, about half of those in the PTSD coach versus um, uh, um, about a quarter in the wait list uh, changed by 10 points or more on the PCL. And that was uh, statistically significantly different. So um, that's out there, kind of self-management, entirely self-management. We also were interested in bringing PTSD coach into VA primary care. So PTSD is highly prevalent, prevalent in primary care patients. About 12% of our veterans have PTSD and show up in primary care. And in primary care, there's no brief evidence-based treatments like there are for depression, anxiety, and hazardous drinking in primary care. So, um, and we know that patients are really reluctant to go on to seek specialty mental health care. So we have a lot of folks who screen positive for PTSD in primary care. And when we offer them a uh, referral to appropriate care, uh, they say, no, thank you. Or they say, okay, and then they never show up. And so we need to, to um, do something um, better in primary care for our veterans with PTSD and do a better job of transitioning them to um, the appropriate care that they, they deserve. So we did a trial, Dr. Kyle Passamato um, and, and our team, we did a trial, um, a pilot study um, looking at uh, PTSD coach with and without clinician support. So, and the clinician support is largely based on supportive accountability. Um, it's a four session kind of brief treatment, um, 20 to 30 minutes of four sessions over eight weeks. So it can be accommodated into VA primary care with our primary care mental health integration um, providers. So these are folks, um, psychologists, social workers embedded in VA primary care who take care of the veterans' mental health needs. Um, and we compared it to self-management. So this was just an anchoring session, one in-person session, 10 minutes. Here's a handout on PTSD coach, um, go and use it. Um, and we had 20 participants um, who had PTSD or probable PTSD based on a PCL4 greater than or equal to 44. And these were folks who were not interested in receiving specialty mental health care. So the folks that weren't going to be going on um, to the mental health clinic or to the PTSD clinic. And our hypothesis, hypothesis given what we had learned from PTSD coach um, out there with the community, is that we would probably see some improvements in PTSD symptoms from PTSD coach alone but that we would see larger improvements if we have um, clinician support involved, obviously. And so you can see here, mostly men like our veteran sample. These were um, mostly our triple O veterans. So um, veterans who were deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan, and they had a, a, a moderate level of PTSD. So you can see it's 53.5 um, on the PCL4. 
what we found was that um, there was no um, significant between group difference, but you could see the effect size was, and this is only 10 and 10, so it's very, very small pilot, but the effect size was 0.54, uh, but not significant. And you can see the within group change for both the PTSD only, uh, PTSD coach only, and the PTSD coach plus clinician support. Um, we had a, a, a medium, small effect size for self-management only, and we had a fairly large effect size for um, the clinician-supported PTSD coach. Again, this is uh, four brief sessions uh, over eight weeks uh, with the app. So really encouraging um, data there. In terms of the second outcome, can we get folks into treatment who need treatment by using this clinician-supported PTSD coach protocol? You could see here um, in the... Um, uh, accepted a mental health referral um, that 90% of those in clinician support accepted a mental health referral versus 25% in self-managed PTSD coach, that they had actually attended 70% attended um, versus 40% who, um, who, I guess, spontaneously, we had a couple who, who went on their own um, in that condition. And then you can see of the um, folks uh, who needed specialty PTSD treatment, 70% of those folks uh, went on to get specialty PTSD treatment, which is what we're trying to do, get them the appropriate care that they deserve. And those first two columns in, the, in this table, you can see that our clinically significant change, again, that 10 point um, reduction on the PCL, we're seeing 70% of, or seven of the 10, um, participants in the clinician supported PTSD coach condition showing that level of improvement versus 37.5% in the um, self-managed condition. So really encouraging. It led to a trial that we're just wrapping up. Um, Dr. Kyle Passamato and I, we have a, a VA HSRD uh, merit that we are working, um, cleaning up the data and hopefully we'll have some findings to share in the next year um, as we, we make sense of this all. But we, um, we recruited a large sample of uh, 234 patients, and we um, we randomized randomized them to get either treatment as usual in VA, which in different places means different things, and so we'll have to characterize that to make sure that we have a good comparison uh, against the clinician supported PTSD coach. But we followed those folks up to six months, so we're looking to see if if our clinician supported PTSD coach can help with PTSD and does better than treatment as usual. And we're looking to see if we can get folks into care if they need it. So really exciting. This is a type one, a hybrid type one pragmatic effectiveness trial. Um, and we have really great retention thanks to our incredible study staff with like 91% at post-treatment. So we should be able to answer this question uh, with, uh, with these, these data. So that's PTSD coach, which is, you know, choose your own adventure. Um, it's been likened to kind of like a garden. You can go through the garden any way you want to go through the garden. Um, there's no prescribed path through the garden. We have this other app called Insomnia Coach, where uh, it's a little different in that it's based on CBTI, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. That requires you to do some things before you can um, get a... a, a Kind of an intervention set. So um, it, it requires sleep diary completion um, every day for a number of days before you can set a time in bed recommendation. So you can see here that um, the home screen directs the users to engage with the training plan. So you can see the training plan in the upper left corner there, um, just below the sleep diaries. Um, and it guides them through a five week training plan. So this is kind of the second slide. You can see the training plan, what you're asked to do, um, which is kind of getting a little bit back to kind of the, those internet based interventions. But these are little things that they do every day. They can come in and do, you know, two minutes of this, two minutes of that. They don't need to spend an hour seated uh, going through a, a module. Um, but they're asked to do certain things during the week to do. And then they have, they have to learn things. And then they have to keep doing things as they uh, progress through the, the weeks. Um, but every day they fill out a sleep diary, they um, get feedback from their sleep coach. So it doesn't take a week to find out how you're doing in terms of filling out sleep diaries, abiding by your time in bed recommendation. You get that every day um, based on, you can see there's a little, uh, a little red, uh, sorry, a little yellow or orange kind of exclamation point that this person um, went to bed probably too early. And so that the app would be telling them they need to stay up a bit later to um, restrict their time in bed. What's cool too, is that we got a whole bunch of really fun kind of, did you know that uh, think a 
think of sloth as lazy. A uh, three-toed sloth only gets 14 hours of sleep. Tigers are even more sloth-like uh, in their sleep. These lazy cats get nearly 16 hours of sleep. So just something fun, engaging every day to kind of come back in. And, um, and then what they get is uh, visualization. They get these graphs of their data and the data at, their, at the bottom of the graph, it gives them some information about you know, what they should be looking at. So compare the total time in bed to the total time you're actually asleep. These lines will be close together when you're sleeping efficiently. So this is a five week training plan, really cool. Um, and we know that uh, internet-based interventions, Sleepio, Shut-Eye, other interventions are effective for insomnia. Um, and so we thought, given what we know about our CBTI coach and folks using that as self-help, we should include all of the connective tissue so folks can do this on their own. And we know that folks will do things on their own, or at least a subset of folks will if you give them the, the tools to do that. So we um, then launched a pilot a randomized control trial of Insomnia Coach to see if it was feasible, if folks would use it, would they accept it, would they like it? Um, and then was it potentially efficacious? And so this was a six week randomized control trial comparing Insomnia Coach to a wait list. Um, and these were veterans with probable insomnia disorder. So they met the criteria um, not from a clinical um, interview, but from information that we gathered through self-report and through sleep diaries. And the hypotheses were that insomnia coach would be feasible, acceptable, and show greater insomnia symptom improvement than wait list, and that the effects would be, be maintained at follow-up. You can see our sample was men, which is unusual or largely male, given that um, Sleepio, Shut Eye, those programs were largely validated with women upwards of 80%, not veterans, but community, uh, community samples. These are folks in their mid forties, um, mostly white and having a, a, a level of insomnia indicating um, the insomnia disorder. In terms of feasibility, we could see at six weeks, 75% of our sample were continuing of the insomnia coach uh, participants were using insomnia coach out to six weeks. And then in the follow-up period, you can see that they continue to use the app up to about 30% of folks at, at 12 weeks continuing to use the app. So seeming like it was feasible. In terms of acceptability, we use the mobile apps rating scale, the MARS, and you can see across all of our scales, we're seeing good uh, levels of, of, of um, uh, ratings across these different things, including overall and, and, um, and uh, the different subscales of the, of the MARS. Um, kind of the, the system usability, kind of the most widely used usability scale. We had uh, from our, um, our Insomnia Coach participants, we had uh, excellent um, usability uh, based on that. We also did qualitative interviews and we got great feedback on the qualitative interviews, um, showing really positive, strong reactions to Insomnia Coach. Um, but also some kind of things that they would have liked to have seen and things that, again, always trying to find out if we can improve what it is we're doing. Um, we got a lot of great information about how we might, uh, for version 2.0, improve the app. And, and the other thing we looked at with this trial, before we launched the app, we wanted to know if the app was kind of safe to use. We're asking about sleep restriction, um, which some folks might think is, is, is risky, but none of our participants had any issues with uh, safety or any kind of negative things to say about the app. In terms of outcomes, the outcomes were really quite uh, encouraging. If you see here, um, we had, um, in terms of the ISI, we had at follow-up is where we saw our statistically significant improvement of uh, a large effect size between waitlist and, um, and our insomnia coach users, which um, you know, it looked like there was something happening at, at the, at the post-treatment six weeks, but you know, given the self-managed nature of this, folks could use it as much as little as long as they like. Um, it was encouraging to see a pretty large effect size at 12 weeks, might mean that we wanna expand the intervention period a little bit longer. In terms of sleep-related impairment, we did see an effect uh, at post-treatment for that, a medium effect, and then a larger effect at follow-up. Sleep efficiency, we didn't see much there. Um, we didn't see anything there, I should say. But in terms of sleep um, onset latency, so the dotted line, you could see that um, the folks in the insomnia coach condition were falling asleep faster uh, than the folks, or were made more improvements in falling asleep uh, faster than the folks in the um, waitlist condition. Um, and no, chain, no difference in wake after sleep onset, so the time they're spending awake in bed. 
So I'm going to just transition quickly in the last few minutes that I have before we open it up to just talk about um, understanding adoption and promotion of use, so disseminating these apps. There's a real large literature out there that um, kind of tells us what the factors are related to the adoption of a new innovative practice or an innovation uh, of any kind, including like different types of corn that you would be growing in your field. So Everett Rogers has this great book, encourage everybody to read it. Um, and it's weird because it's actually kind of a, you know, it's a good read for what it is, but it's diffusion of innovations. And so I was really inspired by this book to go out and look to see if these diffusion of innovation constructs could give us some ideas about what it is that we would need to do for the dissemination efforts that we have and for developing our apps and helping train our workforce to use them. So the idea is that um, the perceptions of the innovation are gonna determine who's gonna use it. It's kind of really quite simple with some, you know, um, terms that are just a little bit, uh, you know, more wonky, if you will. So you can see here, there's relative advantage. So if the innovation has a clear, unambiguous advantage, so it's better than what you're doing right now, right? You're more likely to do that new thing, right? Is it compatible? Can you bring it into practice? Does it fit with your values and norms? So I'm a psychoanalytic psychotherapist. I would never bring an app into care. That would not be compatible. I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist or a behavioral therapist. Oh, I would love to have an app in care. It would help me track, uh, you know, measure measure outcomes and, and targets and et cetera, et cetera. Great, bring it in. Um, complexity, if something is really complicated, we're not gonna use it, right? Um, so if it's easy, it's more likely to be adopted. And then if folks see like the benefits of it, like you see your, your office mate or your colleague using it um, and they're getting good outcomes, you're more likely to adopt it. And then if you can try it without risk, so these are free apps, you know, um, you can try them out. You don't need a six month, uh, you know, free freemium before you, you have to start paying. Um, if you could try it out uh, without risk, uh, you're more likely to adopt it and with some support too. So we looked at these and what we found was that before we even launched PE Coach, I uh, did a study of the PE provider community. Again, great working in VA. We have these provider communities, thousands of folks trained in evidence-based treatments. We went out to them and said, hey, if we had an app that looked like this, it had X, Y, and Z, so an objective list of kind of here is what we're going to have in that app, um, how likely are you that you would use it if it were available? And we were getting 76% of the provider community saying to some degree, so five to seven on a seven point agreement scale, that they would use it. And what we found was that the reason they would use it um, was their perceptions that it would provide a relative advantage and that it really wouldn't be too hard to use given that everything is in the app. Post-release, we did a study. Um, so after the app was available for about a year, went back to the provider community and about half of them reported that they actually had used PE Coach with their, with their patients. And the folks who hadn't um, used it said that they intended to use it, but their veteran didn't have a smartphone. And this was back in 2015, as you can see. But those folks who hadn't used it, 76 or 77% uh, of them or so said they, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, of those folks, um, I think it was like 90 something percent said that they were going to, um, yeah, uh, sorry, 70, 77 percent of those folks said they intended to use it who hadn't used it. So um, a lot of them were saying, again, that it was the veteran they didn't have an opportunity yet to use it with. But the folks who had used it, 94 percent said that they uh, intended to continue using it. What predicted use, which is interesting, is complexity. So again, sharing with the development team, we need to reduce complexity to get folks to use it, or we need to help train folks up in using it. We did a similar thing with CBTI Coach. Again, uh, before we launched the app, um, this in this community, given the, the kind of real benefit of, of having this app available, 87% um, of them agreed to some degree that they would use CBTI Coach if it were available. And we can see across these diffusion constructs um, what's, what's um, driving this intent to use, uh, relative advantage, compatibility, and reduced complexity, uh, complexity uh, predicted intent to use. So really encouraging findings there. And then once we had it available a year after we launched it, um, we, um, we found that 50%, similar to what we found with PE Coach, reported using CBTI Coach and 98% intended to continue using it. So that's really super encouraging. They saw the benefit in it. And you can see that 83% of those who hadn't used it intended to use it. They just hadn't had an opportunity, a lot of them with veterans with smartphones. Um, and the constructs that were predicting um, use was, were compatibility, 
um, low complexity or ease of use, uh, seeing others using it, uh, uh, observability, and then trialability that they could use it without risk. So um, really kind of cool stuff that we, uh, we are seeing. Um, I'm not going to cover this one, but similar kind of things. This is when we asked VA uh, primary care mental health providers about their use of apps um, and how they were using apps in primary care. Um, again, we find the same kind of constructs predicting who are using and who are not using apps in care. Um, but I think what I want to highlight is that 29% providing a list of apps. And so what's cool is that from um, the beginning or relatively early on in, in our uh, development of apps, we were closely collaborating with the, the DOD's um, T2, Telehealth and Technology Center of Excellence. Um, and they came up with this idea of a prescription pad, which is really cool. Um, leaving aside what's happening with FDA and with folks getting clearance to market for, for um, their apps for uh, prescriptions and all the other stuff. This is just a kind of simple, fun thing that um, we have available. And I'll, I'll, I have a link to the resource if you want to order some of these to use. But what you can do is you can have these prescription pads. And in primary care, for example, you can check off an app or two that you think would be helpful for your patient give them some recommendations and then send them on their way. And maybe you follow up with them, you can check in to see how it goes, a supportive accountability kind of way um, or not. They have something in hand, something tangible, something they can remember to do that when they get home, they can download and, and start using the app. So this is one way we've been getting the word out, disseminating the apps to our providers. Another um, uh, major, this is really a, not even comparable to that, but uh, a major initiative that Pearl McGee Vincent and uh, Katie Uhouse and their tech into care team, um, they were able to get DOD VA funding to do a joint incentive fund uh, project to bring mobile mental health apps into um, VA care and DOD care. But just looking at VA care, um, what they did is they targeted 19 sites around the country where they had site visits. Um, this was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So they went virtual with most of them, but 19 sites. Um, and they had 30 local site champions or uh, M Health specialists. So you can see that cool badge in the upper right hand corner of the M Health specialists were designated at each of these sites, were the champions. And then they had M Health ambassadors, the blue badge on the left side. And these were uh, um, 1,100 1, staff trained to become M Health ambassadors. So to kind of get the word out about the app. And they had a campaign that these ambassadors would each reach 25 veterans um, with, uh, um, reach 25 veterans to get them to use apps. There were other kind of outcomes of this um, project, including uh, the COVID coach app that was launched and the digital safety plan that was, uh, the digital suicide safety plan that was embedded in PTSD coach. Um, but you can see the, uh, the number of veterans introduced to VA mobile mental health apps in 2020 they projected they were going to get about 5,000. They actually got 20, almost 23,000 veterans. So really incredible outcomes. Uh, you could see the number of staff trained here. Uh, in 2021, there's 1,585. They projected 810. So the uptake in the field has been incredible. And you can see in this pie graph that they're across the board. It's not just social workers and psychologists, but you can see nurses and peer support specialists, chaplains, um, there's audiologists, these folks, you know, sit down with veterans who have PTSD, other mental health complaints, and it's good for them to have something to help um, their, their veterans. And so providing a mobile app is, is a good way to do that. You could see here the projections of how many folks, um, how many veterans um, would be reached by this program was for this year, it was going to be about 25,000. Instead, it's 56,000. You could see it, it's just exponentially going up over the projection. So really super successful incredible efforts that uh, Pearl and, and her team are, are, are doing to get the word out there. So lastly, I just wanna leave you with some resources. Um, you know, you can, uh, and as I mentioned, you can see that fourth bullet under visit us on, oh, visit us online. Um, you can see there is that um, you can, if you want, you can get those prescription pads and a whole bunch of other kind of cool things if you go to that, um, that website there that's uh, um, listed. Um, and then all of our apps, as I mentioned, are free. You can get them at the App Store or on Google Play. Um, and if you have any technical issues or bugs to report, uh, we have this VA email address. Feel free to uh, shoot us an email. 
One last thing, just to let you know that we too have a um, practice-based implementation network lecture series. And you can see here some folks that you might know. There's Ricardo Munoz who presented in October, uh, Ken Weingart, who used to be our very own Ken Weingart, and then was uh, CBIT's very own Ken Weingart. Now he's out there in industry. Um, he presented last week, and then we have one tomorrow with uh, Alyssa uh, Kozlov, who will be presenting on mindfulness for caregivers of older adults. And these are entirely free, open to anybody, both, both inside and outside VA, and they include um, CEs if you need CEs for your license. So I'm going to take a deep breath, and I'll stop there, and I think we probably have some time for questions. Yes. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, we do have some questions, but I'm I'm also just um, just really taking it all, and that was really incredible. Thank you so much. Um, I'll jump right in because um, the first one is a little bit longer. The latter two are, I think, probably quicker answers relative to our time frame. Um, but the question is, how does the VA think about contracting to high quality apps interventions created by third parties um, versus developing tools in house, and what considerations drive those decisions? Yeah, so that's that's been always the tension, right? It's the the pay versus build, and um, and um, who do you contact in VA? And and we get a lot of folks reaching out to us, you know, and oh, I want to share this or that, and then it becomes like you know they're trying to get us, and we're not the conduit through which you get, <laughs> um, you know, um, into VA to be to to buy a license for your product. And so it's not really clear. The Office of Connected Care. Um, which is kind of our central office, the national office. Um, you know, we're in the shop in, in, in National Center for PTSD, um, but the Office of Connected Care has been um, considering this and how to, how to do that. But, um, you know, there was tension in the last administration around, you know, why, why are we building these apps in-house? We have people who we contract with to cut the grass and we have people who paint the lines in the parking lot. Why don't we just contract this out, you know, um, and there was a lot of pressure and kind of worry, existential angst about that. Fortunately, we pushed back, uh, you know, stressing the importance that these are for veterans and who's going to be building an app for smoking cessation for veterans and, you know, and uh, how it, it's just not a viable product. Um, and so for whatever reason, we, we still kind of exist and we demonstrate our value, but I'm not really sure exactly if there is a mechanism, a way to get into VA. I know there's some apps that are being used and some of it is like as prosthetic devices, you know, a service here or there in a hospital will pull their credit card out and buy some apps for some of their, their residents or, you know, for some of their, um, their patients, but I'm not really sure there's any one kind of place um, in VA where, where this is being done. And I know this wasn't the crux of the question, but the apps are gorgeous that you showed us that are available. I mean, they're so relative from that high quality piece. They're just really incredible. So um, the second one is when will the CBT for chronic pain app be released publicly? <laughs> I, I never estimate ever. I learned very early on coming in the spring of 2011. <laughs> that's what i would say for the android version of ptsd coach we launched ptsd coach in i think in march uh, for ios and we had coming in the spring of 2011 and it was coming in the spring of 2011 for a while and so i would imagine that you know our pipeline it's probably like uh, a, a good year um and then it might be a little bit more um slack there given that there's a lot of things in the pipeline and if something else needs to be prioritized we prioritize it um but I'm thinking that, yeah, within the next year or so, I think it's slated to be developed. So um, it should be available. Um, well, the same with... person wrote back while we were talking, I think in response to your first one to say, please keep making them in-house. You all do a great job and the cost parentheses free makes them very accessible. So I think that's a really nice closing comment. And um, they had also asked if the copy of the slides are available. So it's a good chance for me to share. Um, this webinar will be posted on our um, CBITS um, Pay our website, which is a link to YouTube. Um, but then if they, if um, attendees wanted a copy, Eric, would they um, email you or? Yep, sure. Okay. I, I, and I can send you a copy. I'll just run it by the team, make sure everybody's cool with everything. So, um, and I'm going to share with the team the, the, the nice feedback that, that you uh, shared with me. All right. Well, uh, that I think concludes it. So thank you so much, Eric, for, uh, for, for really a wonderful talk. Um, and I just want to remind people that next week, or next month, uh, the first Tuesday 
Uh, Zabina Wilhelm from uh, Harvard and Mass General will be talking about digital mental health and OCD and related disorders. Um, so in the meantime, I wish everybody happy holidays and we will see you all next month. Take care all, thank you. Bye-bye, thanks. <laughs>